Hello, do you like to add a bunch of stuff to the games that you play? Well, I've got the perfect modification for your D&D experience, Stibble's Codex of Companions. This book that I done wrote has over a hundred new creatures, mechanical ways to make friends, and something I haven't mentioned much before, dueling mechanics. Protected by magic and rules, without any peer pressure or cruelty, companions can engage in the exhilarating sport of sparring. We also have like a crazy amount of magic items and spells to make sure your companion lives forever, which means your party has friends forever. Grab the PDF or pre-order some of our physical stuff down below, and thanks for the support. Welcome to the world of funny dogmen who have the exact opposite of what you could consider a contagious laugh. These poor howling hyenas suffer from a constant case of the munchies, one so strong that not even a Snickers bar can satiate them. Because they are themselves when they're hungry. Because hungry is what they are. And kind of all they are. It seems a little bleak at first. To understand a bit of their core, we need to look at their god, who is also their dad, and their history. Once upon an apocalypse, there was a 14 foot tall demon that kind of looked like a big twisted dog. Wait, he, he's not that big. How big is Clifford? Tw 25 feet? What the hell is Clifford? That's not just a big red dog, that's a borderline colossal dog. Clifford is half as big as a Tarrasque, and he sends shockwaves into the ground when he walks. That's so much scarier than this two-story African wild dog. I, I got off track. So this big, but not that big dog man came from an endless abyss to the material plane for two reasons. To fight and to eat. Aptly named the Lord of Savagery, it moved across populated areas and just slaughtered everything in sight. Like a huge wave of death, or the lich in Adventure Time where he shit in the ocean and killed all those fish, nothing but death was left behind. And if you know anything about ecosystems, balance breaks always have one living thing that thrives on it. And in the waves of dead predators, carry-on creatures thrive. So as Yinagu fought, hyenas gathered in his wake and ate all the stinky rotting bodies like it was a Vegas-style buffet. The book literally says that they ate until they got too fat to move, like this. And then the demon king came back with a big sewing needle and popped all of them, and the explosion of flesh created gnolls. The big dude was eventually beaten back to the abyss, but he had a get out of jail free card, so he came back, and then they beat him back again. But by that time, he already had Atzel, the Cave of Eternity in play, so he came back another time, but then this time they caught him for tax evasion, so he's back in the abyss for, for now. On each of his visits, he made a bunch of kids, like an American war hero, and they're here to stick around and keep eating. But here's another nature lesson. Animals act almost exclusively to gather energy in reliable ways and conserve it until it can be spent to gather more. They don't get greedy or unreasonably ambitious, and a lot of fights in nature are just birds noticing cats, and then that signals them to fuck off. Hunters avoid the young, the fit, and the attentive. Battles are won and lost without spending any energy at all. But gnolls aren't natural. They're extensions of a godlike beast. So when they feast, he feasts. And when he acts, they act. Yinagu can be considered an unseen mother bee with gnolls, guiding their every action and fueling their fury with weird omens. If a gnoll's legs, arms, ears, eyes, and snout were removed but it somehow survived, it would still act with as much anger and hunger as a drunk guy when somebody mentions that the pizza delivery man is running late. They don't get tired, they don't get full, and they always stay angry. So let's look at the structure of their endless hunt. Even though they're a bunch of hungry, rotting dogs, they still know a battle tactic or two. Or five. Tactic number one. If somebody looks like a bodybuilder ate a bodybuilder, and he's in the same party as a four-year-old with asthma, they attack the weak first. War is a game of numbers for them, so women and children go down first. Tactic two. Stay away from the guy that has enough muscle mass to implode in on himself, unless Yinagu sends a very clear omen. For example, a blood splatter that spells out, go kill that guy for me, the one with the muscles. And then a hundred of them will attack him all at once. Third tactic, spread out everywhere. They never linger and rarely hit the same place twice. They have a lot of pet hyenas that follow and eat with them. And eventually these things pop into new gnolls. So I guess that hyena pups are like larvae and then hyenas are like pupae and then morbid obesity is like a cocoon 
and nulls are adults, so I guess they never run out of soldiers. I hate that. Fourth tactic. Don't chase prey that runs away. Fill them with like 900 arrows, that's easier. Fifth tactic. Actually do chase prey if it runs away. Survivors mean evidence, which means that their prey might turn around and hunt them. So no survivors, no bodies left behind, and if they fail, they get the heck out of there. The no survivors rule never applies to your own forces. That's how you lose a war, by, by killing your soldiers. Words of wisdom. Let's look at the variety of soldiers that make up their war bands. First, the not soldiers. We have the hyenas. For safety, there's usually a shit ton of them, and most of them are tubby. Next up is cultists. Yep, th there, there are some crazy people out there. Humanoids who worship Yinagu are eventually touched with a maddening hunger and become, like, shitty versions of gnolls. Gnolls are okay with them, united under the same purpose and the same dad. Then we have gnoll warriors. They're th the things that I've been describing this whole time. Then we have gnoll hunters, who are the scouts and rangers of the group. They do reconnaissance, but also kill the shitty guys who can't keep up just because their legs are broken. Bunch of wusses. Call the herd. Then we have fangs of Yinagu. Big Dad Doggio gave a few of these guys a kiss on the cheek and now they can fight a lot better, and also convert cultists or dogs into more gnolls. Like a witch doctor hyena man. Flesh gnars are like bouncy razor blade fighters that jump into battle and tear everyone to shreds with both swords and teeth. Instead of using bows to kill stragglers like normal, they race after them like nightmare assassins. Then we have pack lords. These things carry the biggest sticks, kill the most, and sometimes have magic powers. They direct most groups and act like battle masters. Above them in rarity are things called flins, which are like gnoll demigods. They're daddy's favorites, so they get a special toy. The flail of madness, and pain, and paralysis, all rolled into one. They're very scary. Last, but also definitely least, is the witherlings. The most unnatural way that a knoll survives long streaks of starvation are these strange, explosive battles where they kill and eat each other. But then they just keep the bones of the dead so that their leader can raise them as undead soldiers. Like imagine eating your work friend Paul to stave off starvation, and then your boss turns him into a skeleton so he can come to work the next day, and Paul just has no hard feelings, even though you ate his liver like two days ago. This is because savagery is just an ingrained part of, well, the children of the Lord of Slaughter. And that's basically Knowles.